Um, look, you said that you were looking at all the different religions, yeah? Once again, you said you don't accept idolatry and stuff. Like, I, accept, I accept that, I believe in that as well, I, I agree with you. Look, the first thing I want to say to you is, from a Muslim perspective, from an Islamic perspective, yeah? Is that we would say, the starting point for us is um, a very strict monotheism. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for us, um, the starting point is like a monotheism. Well, we believe that there is an ultimate creator, sustainer, an ultimate power that initiated the universe, if that makes sense. Now, how feasible does that sound in your mind? How, how rational does that sound in your mind? Yeah, I, I believe that the creator is what brings life to the material realm. The yeah. material realm is just an illusion. Okay? Yeah. We can't take any of this stuff with us when we go. So the idea of an immortal God from which we all originate gives us purpose. So you agree with that idea? You accept it, I mean? Do you believe in it? The creator, yeah. yeah. The creator gives life to existence, yeah. I'm right, okay. confused though, you said you were an imper Im empiricist. Empirical theology. I and don't, you okay. believe in I'm gonna, evidence. I'm, yeah, yeah, go on. But if you haven't got evidence for God, you, how can you, you then you believe in your... I don't believe, okay, I don't God. believe, for example, that the earth was created in seven days. Because that's creation, it's different between a creator and creationism. Creationism is something different, okay? But as an empirical... So you're saying you, you reject kind of like the biblical narrative, but at the same time you don't reject the idea of an all-knowing, all-powerful creative force that started the universe? Correct, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, all right, so what I was going to say now, since that's the case, now we have to define some of the attributes of this creator, yeah? Would you accept that some of the attributes are creative capacity or uh, power or, or knowledge? Would you say that these are fundamental to, to such yeah, a force? Yeah, of course. Uh, creativity. Yes. Muslim YouTube. Is, is, uh, the, yeah, you're saying it's the creative the creative essence of the universe and of individual souls, yeah. yeah. That is God, I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, how can we, how, you know, intuition, for example, yeah. this is a fundamental metaphysical function of our, of our personality, our soul. Yeah. How can we, you know, how can we, we, we can't prove, we can't program a, a machine, for example, to do these things. So how can we ever prove that uh, this is, exists outside of this? World? Yeah, it's good. All right, so having said that, I want to ask you a question. What's the most appropriate relationship you can have with such an entity? The most appropriate relationship is one oh, yeah, of yeah, harmony, yeah. essentially. Okay? Essentially, when you live in harmony with mankind and with the planet, you are living in harmony with God. There is no separation between the effects that you enact upon the world and what uh, comes to you, what moral, moral consequences. Uh, okay, I, I accept that to a certain extent. Let me tell you something. We have our own version of that, right? So we say, because if you look at the Eastern traditions, they do reference how to be one with God and these kinds of things. From our perspective, we say there is a way to, to basically be harmonious with the will of the, with the Creator. And the way that works is basically, the Creator has, uh, made, has created the creation. And in the creation, you have animate and inanimate, right? Uh, as for the inanimate objects around us, they are forcibly or... Um, obliged to kind of submit to the will of the of, of the creator right yeah. so basically in, in other words in order to be one with creation in that sense not in the sense of actual physicality but we're talking in that uh, figurative sense the way to do that would be to do what everything else around you is doing so everything around us if you accept the premise of an, an all-powerful creator is submissive to that creator we would say by extension it makes sense to also be submissive to the Creator uh, in the same way that everything around us is being submissive. Does that make sense? I completely agree, yeah. Submissive to, yeah. but we know... The will of the Creator. Exactly, the will of the Creator, but never to an authoritarian figure. That's why I'm so against idolatry. Yes. Because anyone, these false prophets or these uh, dogmatic beliefs, these are, these, are not fun these are not creations of God, but they're creations of human beings. And so never listen to a, a boss or... Uh, something that doesn't agree with your own sense of morality that comes from within, but live in harmony with, with that, that intuition which comes essentially from God. Right, so let me ask you a question because the thing is, it becomes very subjective when it becomes clouded in that kind of terminology, I'll be honest with you. Because what we would say is that if our, essentially our aim in life is to be submissive to God, right? Um, in the sense that I've just, pre uh, just aforementioned. If that's the, the aim of life or the purpose of life, surely 
there should be a uniform way, a universal way, that God has allowed human beings to be able to do that. A uniform, I agree. Yeah. yeah. So now, the, we would say, this is the Islamic narrative. I'll be completely straightforward with you. Yeah. The Islamic narrative is that the way that happens is that the Creator communicates with the creation. And He does so through prophets who have come before time. Yeah. So prophets are a necessary extension of what is necessary to happen or uh, appropriate between the Creator and the creation. Yeah. Or in this case, human beings specifically who are sentient beings and um, able to make their own decisions yeah. on, on, on free-willed creatures. Yeah. So there was a need for prophets. There was a need for the communication between the Creator and the creation. And so prophets came all four time. The Islamic narrative is that so long as humans were on earth, there were prophets preaching the message of what we'd call submission. Yeah. So people like Adam, you might have heard of these kind of biblical names, Adam and Noah and Moses and Jesus. All of those are prophets that came to their respective peoples and their respective times and preached the message of submission to their peoples. Does that make sense? Completely. Yeah, yeah. Right. So what we would say is that the, the messengers came fundamentally with two different things. They came with a message and they came with a an evidence base to substantiate that message. Um, so in the, in the case of Moses, you might have heard of these stories of basically, you know, the sea splitting and all these kind of different things. Yeah, It's in the Old Testament, it's also in the Quran. Um, these stories are meant to indicate that these, these are evidences yeah, that uh, are used to prove the message of submission. Because there's something which break the natural capacity of physical reality around us. So there are evidence that basically God is, is the author of of the message that these prophets come with. Now, whereas all of the prophets and messengers were sent to their respective... Can I ask you, is, yes. this, is this sea splitting? Why is that... I mean, why, why does that give evidence that this is uh, the word? Why, why, what does that got to do with Muhammad, for example, the sea splitting? Right, so no, the sea splitting doesn't have anything to do specifically with Muhammad's message. But it's, I mean, although it is in the Quran, we're talking specifically about Moses. So in his time, and this is an interesting thing that um, has actually been alluded to by some of our scholars in Islam, that depending on the societal um, kind of what's societally popular at the time, the, the evidence base that the messengers come with suits that. So at the time of kind of, what is it, the, um, the young, uh, what do you call it, the Middle Empire, whether, wherever it is in Egypt, when Ramses II was there, uh, and they say that Ramses is linked to, to Pharaoh and whatnot. Let's mention the Bible. At this time, they were fascinated with magic. Magic and all those kind of things. Now, Moses came with a, you could call it a miracle really, which basically broke the rules of physical nature. Yeah? And which, um, which acted as an evidence for, the, for his people. So when people saw it, they said, okay, well, this makes sense. Do you see what I'm saying? Right. Right, so for, for us now, we will say, what's our miracle? Right, because we need some evidence as well to be able to substantiate the claim that Prophet Muhammad is the final messenger, because that's our claim. We're, our claim is that Prophet Muhammad, whereas all of the other prophets were sent to their people in their times, Jesus, Moses, etc., Abraham, Muhammad was sent for all peoples in all times. So that's the Islamic narrative. So his, what he's come with, is he's come with an auditory um, miracle, or an auditory uh, evidence base. Whereas all the prophets came before, usually with a visual evidence base. So like, for example, in the case of Moses, the sea splitting was something for human beings to visualize and see. Whereas what we say is the evidence base for the Islamic message is actually the Quran itself, which is something actually which was transmitted orally, although it does have, of course, written books as well to, to, to corroborate and triangulate the, the veracity of the oral message. So here, the Quran has many different things within it which basically would lead someone to believe that it couldn't have been because you were saying you use a kind of like rationalistic approach we're using a probabilistic kind of rationalistic approach you would i would argue that the quranic discourse contains within it an evidence base Can I just interrupt you there? I, i'm actually not a rationalist i'm an empiricist which okay is sorry yeah an antithesis of, of uh, rationalism. rationalism oh yeah I, I think i got mixed up then yeah yeah we can't just rush. we need experience to fair enough to inform our i think you're right about that as well and that's why, by the way, the fundamental thing in Islam is as follows. One of the, one of the, the, the fundamental messages Islam comes with is as follows. Whereas Christianity says we're born with original sin, yeah? Islam says no, we're born with something called the fitrah. 
The fitrah is a predisposition to, to basically submit to God, not only to know who He is, that, that higher power, but to submit to Him automatically. So this presupposition is awakened by the various messages or the various um, evidences that human being is there, thereafter exposed to. So human being is, for example, exposed to the, the fine-tuning of the universe. And you don't have to be a physicist to, re, to, to appreciate the fine-tuning of the universe. You can literally look with your naked eye at the fact that the universe is, in fact, finely tuned, right? Um, and these kind of things aim to reawaken human beings from their state of slumber into um, the recollection of God. Yeah. So that's the main thing of the Islamic message. As with the Quranic discourse, as we've said before, it has within it evidences, we would say, which are very powerful in convincing people that this is a, a, basically something which has to be extra human. In other words, it couldn't have been um, put together by a human uh, ability. So we would say, for example, the fact that the Quran precisely discusses events that happens in the future. And I'll give you one example of that. There, at the time of the Prophet, there were the Romans and the Persians. And the Quran makes very specific predictions about who will win wars. And in the case of chapter 30, verse 1 to 6, it talks about the Romans decisively going to beat the, the Persians in three to nine years in a nearby land. Now, these are, this is one of many different predictions of the future that the Quran makes and that the Sunnah, which is the secondary um, book of the corpus that Muslims believe in, or the Hadith, the strong Hadith, uh, make of the future. And from a probabilistic perspective, we can say, okay, well, probably if someone says one thing or two things, they might have guessed them to be correct. But if we put them all together, it becomes very, very difficult to make the argument that he guessed all of those correct. Especially when we consider, by the way, did you know, let me tell you something. In, Je in Jehovah's Witness, uh, in, the, in, the, in the church of the Jehovah's Witness, you know, they predicted, and by the way, they believed in this kind of thing where people were being, you know, divinely inspired. They predicted that the Day of Judgment will be on 90, in the year 1977. You know that. And when that year did not, ha when the Day of Judgment didn't happen on that year, they called it the Great Disappointment. Because, I mean, I don't know why anyone would be disappointed for the Day of Judgment not happening, but they called it the Great Disappointment. The reason why is because the prediction didn't materialize. And that has repercussions and ramifications for the message because it couldn't have been divine if it didn't materialize because it, it was meant to be from an all-knowing source. Yeah. Can I ask you about yeah. the Quran? You know, the, the, the saying the Quran predicted the Romans were... Going to uh, defeat the Persians, yeah. What, what was the Romans? Uh, or didn't the Roman Empire fall before... The Roman um, Empire fell out for... Uh, or you're talking about the Holy Roman Empire. I'm not talking, first of all, the two Roman Empires, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the Roman Empire started in the year 31 BC, yeah? Uh, the, Gal uh, the Gallic Wars and stuff like that, whatever, and it continued on. Yeah. But then the Holy Roman Empire started, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, now, the Byzantine Empire, which was what was around at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, oh, yeah. and continued on to, until the 1400s, oh, yeah. this is what we're referring oh, to. Okay. Yeah, okay. But the, the Roman Empire, as you would have known from the history lessons that you'd have done, were in constant wars with the Sassanid empires, or they're also called the Sassanians, Sassanians, something like this, yeah? Basically, the, the, the Persians. And, the, and this was referred to in the Western history books as the Roman Sassanid Wars. Now, the point is the Roman Empire, as you would have known, from, from the year 400 onwards, and the Prophet came around 630, uh, you know, around that time, so from the 7th century. But from that year, from that time period, it was going down. The, there was a degeneration of the Roman Empire anyways. And so the Sassanid Empire was much stronger. So when the Quran made the claim that the Roman Empire was going to beat the Sassanid Empire in three to nine years in a nearby land, all these different things, it was, an, it was a kind of ridiculous claim if you think about it from a probability perspective. It's the equivalent of betting on a very low team, maybe in the Champions League, beating a very high team, maybe in the top five in the, um, in the Premier League, right? Uh, and betting that they will beat them in a certain way, in a certain place, in a certain time period, and all these different things. So probabilistically, the odds are very low for that. And that's one example, but there are many different examples. For example, the conquest of Arabia by the Muslims. The fact that other nations will fall into the hands of the Muslims like Egypt and Yemen and Syria and Jordan, you know, and Pakistan and India, Sindh, Dual Hind, and all these different places which are now part of the, uh, the, the Islamic Empire have been predicted to be conquered by, the, by Muslim hands, by, basically. So all of this is, when we put this into a probability generator, it becomes very difficult to argue that could, this all could have been guessed. And I would actually argue and make a very daring claim here and say 
This, has, this kind of frequency and accuracy of predictions has never been, able, has never been predicted by anyone. Think of, I don't know of any human being, if you want to bring Nostradamus or the, the Jehovah's Witness or anyone that, you want to, that have made predictions of the future with this, many, with this much frequency and detail, which have actually materialized in the way that they've materialized. Sounds, yeah, sounds, sounds quite interesting. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So here when we say we have evidence for the veracity and the truthfulness of Islam, we're not just saying that we have uh, kind of superfluous evidence or kind of arbitrary subjective type evidences. Our evidences are probably, uh, are, are actually um, can be um, analyzed objectively. Do you see what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. This is not regarding the fact that the Quran is also in and of itself, a book that claims that it has no contradictions, a book that challenges mankind to produce a chapter like it, a book of the, we would actually make the argument that the only religious, ancient religious book, ancient religious book which has been preserved in terms of its, 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 its material, its corpus. We've never, the Muslims have never had a controversy, and this can go on the record, and believe me, I'm here every week, and people try and, they'll try and uh, maybe, but I can say this completely clearly, the Muslims have never had a controversy on what constitutes the Quran. Never. It's never happened. They've had controversies on everything else, but they've never had a controversy on what constitutes the Quran. The Christians, or on the other hand, they, they are differing on how many, ca how many books are in, uh, in, in, in the biblical canon. The, the Protestants say 72 books, the Catholics say, sorry, the Protestants say um, 66, the Catholics say 72, the Eastern Orthodox say 81. So here, we don't even know how many books are in the, in the Bible, let alone the manuscripts and these things. So here, what we're saying is not only do we have evidences that are analyzable, if that's a word, but also we have that which is necessary for a book to be a word of God, a preserved book, f free from contradiction and unimitable. Uh, so with that, do you, do you see the power of the um, the, the argument? Yeah, uh, no, I, I believe that it's been like, uh, you know, you when you buy a software for the first time and you install updates, yeah. it's like uh, Christianity came along, that was one update, and we've had Islam, that was yeah. the final. Yeah, I think that's a good way. The thing is that uh, we, 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 uh, the, pro the only problem was, yeah, yeah. in any religion, is violence, as you know. Yes. Uh, we've always seen this violence uh, in, in all religions. I'm not trying yeah. to blame any. Yes, yeah. Uh, I think that the only problem is that uh, the thing that uh, people blame Islam for yeah. Yeah. is uh, why are they so violent in that yeah. area? Yeah. There is, you know, they have to kind of look at themselves. You're, say, you're right. The Western intervention, we also have to exactly. look at the. Exactly, exactly. You know, the, the, you know, that area of the world has been a kind of hotspot of different civilizations. Like you had Rome to the west, you had the Mongols, the Arabs, right. all competing, going yeah. uh, and, uh, and of course that violence is very harmful to uh, empiricism and it causes yeah. arguments. You know, Shia, Islam, Sunni, Islam. Yeah, but, okay, I, I accept what you're saying, you're right. Violence is never a good thing, but that's just... Uh, I, I, that's what I'm saying. In defense of Islam, mm, yeah. when people accuse Islamic world of being so violent, yeah. look at the cultural context here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if we look at the raw data, uh, you'll find that in terms of population, I would actually make the argument that Islam Muslim people, as a proportion of the population, are probably the least violent. I know that sounds ridiculous. In the last hundred years, they have proven to be the least violent people in the world in terms of religion. Why? And what, this is going to sound ridiculous. Some guys laughing their head off in, at home there, believe me. But if you count the amount of people that have died as a result of the imperialistic wars of uh, World War One, World War Two, also if you count the four wars of America, and if we consider state violence as a kind of violence, which we sh there's no reason for us not to, we'll come to the conclusion that the most violent people have been atheists like Stalin and others, and um, Christians. If you consider Hitler a Christian, I don't know why he considered himself, and people like him and so on and so forth. Islam actually fares quite reasonably and in the grand scheme of things uh, as a, pro a proportion of the population, especially if we talk about the colonial period because most of the Muslim world was subjugated under the colonial Western rule, it fares actually quite well. But having said that, because of per kind of the post-Cold War terroristic um, backlash that we've been getting yeah. and the, uh, the focus on terrorism, so a lot of people now will think of Islam as a violent religion. But we shouldn't think, just looking at the raw data of Islam as any more or less violent as other world faiths who have proponents of those faiths 
actually performing more, more violence uh, in, the, in the span of the last 100 and 150 years uh, than Muslims. But going back to what I was saying, I was saying that, look, we have an argument for um, basically the, the truthfulness of Islam. Yeah? I'm not going to lie to you. I believe, I just want to be straightforward with you, yeah, because I like you, you know, you're a nice guy, you dress well. You know, I came here, not, I didn't even, I didn't even dress properly today, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I just came, uh, you know, I, I was going to, I was going to come, I, I wasn't going to come today, but I'm happy I did because I had a conversation with you, yeah? Listen to me. I'm going to tell you directly. I believe that the purpose of life is to worship God through submission. Not only is that the case, I believe that the guidelines for human beings is therefore the Quran, because it's the final book for the reasons I've mentioned. So if you want to live a fruitful life which is in, in compliance with the will of God, it's got to be done through the injunctions of uh, the Quran and the Sunnah. Now, I've given you the reasons why, like I've given you somewhat of an epistemological base as to why we believe in what we believe. Do you accept that that epistemological base that I've given you is an argument which can be accepted or should be accepted uh, based on the evidences put forward? I agree completely. Oh. I think that unless someone comes up with a more up-to-date uh, version of truth, uh, theological truth, yes. I suppose you know, uh, it can make sense to accept that as the most up-to-date. Uh, Fantastic. So what we can do is we can do the Shahada, right? <laughs> now the Shahada is the declaration of faith. Now you believe in, do you believe in what I've just said? Do you, do you agree that the Quran is probably the word of God based on what I've told you? Uh, yeah. Okay, so what you do now is you, uh, it's good now to become a Muslim and what the word Muslim actually means is someone who submits their will to God. As we've said in the beginning, that's the whole point of it. And what I'll do is I'll give you my number and me and you will discuss more like, you know, how to kind of perform your rituals and these kind of things. We'll get you a, a package of things to do and watch and stuff like that. We'll take it easy on you. But how do you feel? Should we go for it? Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't call myself not a Muslim. I'm already practicing uh, Muslim in many respects, so yes. it's nothing new for me. But I would very, very much uh, like that. Yeah. yeah. Would you like that? Okay, let's do it then. So I'm going to say in Arabic. You, you answer. Or you just kind of follow what I say, and then I'll say it in English. Okay? Yeah, you say. say yeah, I'll say in Arabic first. Okay. So follow what I say. Ashhadu. You have to say in English. Yeah, I'll say in Arabic, and then you say in Arabic, and then shall I say in English first? No, you say in Arabic. English. Yeah. Okay. Fine. All right. So all right. So say ashhadu. Okay. What is what does it mean though? First? Oh, okay. Sir. No, no. You can't, uh, I can't uh, say. It, all right. right sorry. Sorry. Mean. I'll say that. So what you're gonna say is, I bear witness that there's only one God worthy of worship, being submissive to, which is okay. we believe the God that we talked about. Yeah. yeah. And that the Prophet is the final messenger. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ashhadu. Allah. Allah. Ilaha. Ilaha. Illa Allah. Wa ashhadu. Anna. Anna. Muhammadan. Rasulullah. Rasulullah. Take me! <laughs> well done, well done. Now, now you're part of the family, my friend. Welcome to Islam. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now. You... Nice to meet you on Eid as well. You accept Islam, mashaAllah. Well, we're all here, brothers and sisters. No sins on your slate. No sins on your slate. So now you're... you somebody. Alhamdulillah. Every week somebody. Listen. I started on a video and you ended up in the slate. Every single week of blessings. Alhamdulillah, we keep it going, man. We keep it going, guys. And contribute to it. Alhamdulillah, listen. I'm going to give you my number. Off camera. <laughs> and then you can call me for anything you need, yeah? And by the way, we're probably going to get something to eat afterwards. So you're definitely invited. Today's Eid, by the way. It's one of the extensions of Eid. So you're already in a... Muslim celebration, isn't it? <laughs> Alright, do you want me to give you my number? Have you got your phone with you? MashaAllah. Okay, Smart man. Assalamu alaikum, dear boy. Muhammad. Yeah, yeah, son. Assalamu alaikum, man, to the camera, bro. Assalamu alaikum, bro. So make sure to subscribe to the guy's page.